this evening. Um, and you can read along with me if you have your little pamphlet. Um, so there's a lecture, America, What Went Wrong? That will be given by Donald Barlett. And tomorrow noon lecture is Schooling for the American Dream with Henry Levin. Today's panelists consists of Joe Henry, who is an international representative for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and was an active member of the Teamsters for a Democratic Union, a reform movement within the union. He works directly for the general president as an international representative. Representative Johnny Hammond chaired the subcommittee on health care and social services in the Iowa House. ISU philosophy professor Tony Smith, who is co-director of the Murray G. Bacon Center for Ethics and Corporations in Government, will moderate. So without further ado, here are our panelists. Thank you for all coming this afternoon. Uh, and I'd like to take advantage of uh, my moderator role before handing it over to uh, Joe. Uh, to just mention a little bit about an issue that I'm interested in and that I've read some stuff about, and we're each going to take turns uh, throwing things out um, and be relatively brief so that we can have some a lot of discussion uh, for most of the time this afternoon. But one thing I wanted to talk about and throw out uh, for possible discussion later uh, is what's called the team concept. And this is the idea that you read a lot about in the business press especially, but also in the mainstream media. About a, about a major transition in the way that work is done in the United States. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this talk. Uh, I think it's going to be a crucial part of the Clinton administration agenda. Uh, Robert Reich, who's Secretary of Labor, uh, uses this talk a lot. Uh, and the I basic idea here is to try to get beyond the old antagonism uh, between management and labor in the manufacturing workplace and to enter into some sort of uh, more partnership type of role. Uh, and part of that is um, called, well, it's, it's also talked about in terms of being a win-win situation where both labor and uh, management win by rearranging uh, labor roles. And the basic idea is to move away from the old assembly line uh, setup where one worker does one task over and over again uh, the entire time and replace it with a team setup where a bunch of workers will rotate between different tasks and instead of having to follow orders down in the top-down fashion, uh, they will get to participate in the design of the labor process. And so, in return, uh, it's, so the idea behind this is that this is a more productive arrangement of manufacturing. And so management gets increases in productivity. And in return, uh, labor gets a more creative, challenging workplace where they have more participatory uh, actions. And they also win certain measures of job security as a result. And uh, this model was, is first uh, introduced in Japan. It's, sometimes it's called the Japanese model. But it's it been introduced in the United States as well. And I suppose the Saturn plant uh, by, by GM in Tennessee is the best example, or the best well-known example of this. Uh, OK, well, the, all I want to do today is just, um, is just throw out uh, five different ideas here about why, when you read people talk about um, the, the team concept or the move to more participatory uh, ways of setting up the workplace, uh, that you should also think, just for a second, that while the language here of participation and empowerment and teams is a very positive language, uh, there may be a negative side to this story that doesn't get talked about in the business press and often doesn't get talked about in the mainstream press. Uh, the first point I want to make is that lots of times uh, there's a concept of a two-tiered workforce here. And typically what happens is we talk about certain central plants moving to a team concept where there's participation and job security. The first thing to remember is that these plants that uh, are moving towards this model often depend upon a tier of subcontractors. <coughs> And work conditions in these subcontractors can be quite different. And these things are connected. I think a lot of people in the United States do not know that in Japan, we hear a lot of talk about job security programs in Japan, but only one-fourth to one-third of the Japanese workforce actually has job guarantees. And the remainder of the Japanese workforce are subcontractors working in smaller plants without any of those things. So if we're going to talk about whether the labor management antagonism has been overcome, we've got to look at the whole workforce and not just certain sections of the workforce. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that we're now seeing that some of these job guarantees 
uh, are things that are very easily made when the firms are very profitable, uh, but that firms are on the verge of abandoning them when their profits start to sink. And we've seen recently firms like IBM in the United States, which for, gen which for decades and decades had made job guarantee lifetime job guarantees to their workers. Of course, they're having massive layoffs now. And according to Business Week, we're even beginning to see in Japan, uh, as the Japanese economy, economy starts to take a downswing, that workers who had been guaranteed job, uh, lifetime jobs, that that is now being called into question. So the second point I want to make is, um, before we assume that this antagonism between management and labor has been overcome because workers get job uh, lifetime guarantees, we've got, to be, we've got to make sure that those guarantees really mean something. The third point I want to make is that uh, the move towards a team setup and away from the assembly line setup uh, is usually associated with uh, an uh, abandoning uh, work rules, job classifications, and the seniority system. And this has some problems if we want to evaluate the future of the workforce. Uh, and the first problem is, of course, that when you get rid of work rules and job classifications, and that means that management has the ability to assign workers to different places in the firm at will. And that means there's a built-in mechanism here uh, that management can use uh, in principle uh, to punish people from the workforce that it wants to punish. If you have a plant where there are work rules, uh, in job classifications, you have some protection, uh, or, maybe, or uh, maybe more protection than when these things are abolished. And then if you start to raise issues about safety, for instance, at the workplace, uh, then management can say, well, you're a troublemaker, we're going to assign you over here, and you really don't have any recourse. Uh, the second problem in, about getting rid of work rules and job classification systems and seniority is that uh, if you look at how traditional plants were run, Workers, you know, you, you know you're, uh, have different physical and psychological capacities at different points in your work life, right? A worker in, the, in his 20s or her 20s or 30s uh, can do different things and at a faster pace than a worker in his or her 40s or 50s or 60s. This is an unfortunate physiological fact. Uh, traditionally, the way the job classification system worked is that workers would be able to transfer, as they got more seniority and as they got older, they would be able to transfer into less uh, grueling jobs. When, with the abandonment of job classification and seniority systems, this isn't possible anymore. And so a worker in his or her 40s, 50s, or 60s has to do the exact same job as a worker in his or her 20s or 30s. And in many cases, this is very hard to do, if not impossible to do. One thing that's also not known about the Japanese system is that the average uh, age of a, Japanese, of a worker in a Japanese manufacturing plant is 10 years less than the average age of a worker in U.S. manufacturing. And that's because when a worker gets into his 50s or 60s, um, they'll get a little tap on the shoulder and management will say, you can't really do this job anymore, can you? Maybe you should think about retiring. Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make here is, what does a lifetime job guarantee mean if the job is designed such that a normal average person just simply physically can't do it in his or her 50s or 60s? Uh, having, a, having a legal guarantee to a job uh, doesn't mean much in that circumstance. And then the last point I want to make before I turn it over to Joe is that um, this move to the team structure and uh, is also connected with an increase in the work pace. And the business management literature is very upfront about this. Uh, the mainstream media, when they talk about this, isn't quite as upfront about this. In the traditional plant, the average worker worked 45 seconds out of every minute. That gave that worker 15 seconds to sort of catch his or her breath. In the plant of the future, the plant that we're going to now, the plant of the team concept, where, where, those, where that idea has been institutionalized, the average worker works 57 seconds out of every 60. Now, this is a major, this is a major change in what your life is like, uh, working an average of 45 seconds uh, per minute as opposed to 57 seconds per minute. The amount of added stress uh, in the workday is, is increased tremendously. Uh, we're having a tremendous problem of repetitive motion illness. Repetitive motion illnesses, uh, that, that plague uh, that is, that is uh, uh, broken out, is, is connected, I believe, to the move to the key team concept. Uh, when you have 15 seconds a minute to sort of relax and catch your breath, uh, you in the long term will avoid injury in, the, in a way that you won't if you're working 57 seconds out of every 60. 
And in Japan, we have this phenomenon called Kuroshi, uh, which is the sudden death phenomenon. And a lot of people in Japan think that this level of stress over years uh, leads to just deaths that can't be explained otherwise than as a result of increased job stress at the workplace. So uh, my, my point here before I shut up is just to throw this out as things to, to discuss or talk about or think about. Uh, when we talk about the future of work in the United States, one big part of that is a move towards uh, teamwork and participation, cooperation, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that there are positive things about this move, uh, but I also think there are negative things about this move that we have to think about too. So I'd like to hand it over now to uh, Joe Henry. It's good to be here. It's also nice to know that I get to come back to the school where I graduated from. I got my four-year degree here and majored in psychology and did a little bit of industrial psychology study. And I did learn some of these concepts when I was here. Also during that time, I was working at UPS, and I was wondering to myself why a company like UPS would not use some of these concepts in the way that we had learned them here at Iowa State. And, we found, and I found out, uh, especially that uh, companies like UPS and most major corporations are more concerned with making money than caring about their employees. Uh, so the, team, the type of team concept that is used out there uh, in, in the different types of corporations, you learn about it here, and then when you go to these companies as engineers, uh, uh, computer programmers, or such as myself, I stayed in my truck driving job at UPS, you find out that these team concepts are used to take ideas from workers on how to increase productivity, to liquidate any work rules that the employees may have, and to basically force workers to do more per hour than before. Uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of these major corporations don't use team concept the way that it's been written about in the books, where everybody gets together, devises ways to make the company more productive, and, and make, the, make the employees feel like they're you know, really contributing but uh, it isn't happening. UPS is a good example of that. Uh, uh, at UPS, we have a Teamster contract with that company. We represent 150,000 employees nationwide at UPS. Uh, they have what is called core, keeping our reputation for excellence, which they bring workers into these committees and ask for their ideas on how to uh, increase productivity, increase service, and how we can all just basically work together to, uh, to make the company sell itself to uh, customers, to business customers. And, truck, and the drivers at UPS have done that. The people inside the warehouse have done that. But over the years, their work has increased. Uh, the number of jobs have went down. People are doing more. They're working longer hours. Uh, they're suffering from uh, repetitive uh, what was that term that you used? Repetitive motion injuries. Uh, carpal tunnel where their wrists go bad and uh, their back starts uh, suffering injuries. And you also find this in the computer programming field too where the people who are professionals who get into these team concepts uh, are forced to do more uh, per hour or per minute and uh, they, they lose out. Uh, so Basically, in regards to the team concept, it's not a bad idea as far as what it's meant to do, what it's supposed to do. The problem is, is that many companies within our country would use this to make more money. They do not focus upon the employees and how, it, how to enrich the environment of the employees. Many companies in this country, unfortunately, as you may all be aware, are more concerned about short-term profit than through long-term profit where, where actually enrichment does happen within the job environment. And there are ways that could be found to increase productivity while at the same time not damaging the workers who work at that company. So that in a nutshell is kind of where, you know, we are in the Teamsters Union. We don't, 
We don't feel that team concept is all that bad, but we, we want to monitor it. And especially at companies like UPS, it's been used in the wrong way. We're not against it uh, uh, fully. Uh, another thing to bring up too with the team concept is it's also used by companies to bust unions. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, how they do it is that companies will get people involved in a safety committee or a health and safety committee or some sort of productivity committee. And uh, this committee will find ways to, again, enrich the environment while at the same time making the company more productive. But then the employer starts adding other things into these committees, committees such as how to solve grievances without uh, allowing union representatives to participate. And eventually, in some instances, they attempt to convince the employees that the union doesn't need to exist within the workplace, that the company can do a better job through this committee. So, and this has happened at some of the freight companies that uh, the Teamsters uh, represent the members at. So we, we have had to be very careful about these committees uh, starting up. Uh, they're not always bad, but most of the time they are bad because the companies have a tendency to use them for their own reasons. So that is unfortunate. Uh, with what Robert Reich is talking about, uh, one thing that I heard was interesting that he had said at a hearing was that he would like to see these committees established more so in the workplace, but he, the ones that he has noticed to be most efficient and most effective have been in those workplaces where there has been a union. Because with a union, the workers can get information on what the quality of work life committees are all about, what are some of the danger points to look at, and what are some of the good things that could be looked at in going into a committee uh, with the employer to actually find ways in which to enrich the environment, but not at the cost of the workers and at, at increasing productivity that would damage the worker's body or, or uh, mental stability. So that's kind of it. Okay. Attorney? Well, I want to come at this from a little different perspective, and that is um, the state or the public employee, because that's uh, the area in which I most, uh, with which I'm most familiar. Um, <coughs> our title is the American Worker, and I'm going to go to the Iowa Publicly Employed Worker as uh, focusing in. I think as I uh, thought, tried to think about uh, those Iowa workers, uh, I came up with some trends. And the first trend is that state employees, at least, have no job security anymore. There was a time, I think, when people felt if they were in public employment, they had good job security, they had good benefits. But that is no more. Uh, we've had over 1,000 layoffs in state government since August of 91, and all of that um, as a result of a series of events that I'll review for you. I think most of you are aware of them, but I'll sort of review them for you. The second trend, I think, is hand-in-hand uh, -hand with that first one of uh, no job security, more layoffs, and that is the trend toward privatization. And the, both of those trends actually are going on all over the country in state government uh, as state budgets are stretched to the limits. Uh, you see um, reports, or I do, at least from other states, that the same thing is happening. There's more layoff, more privatization. Now, I happen to not have a problem with privatization at, in and of itself. That is, contracting out for services that normally government would provide for the people. But what I do have a problem with is when that privatization means that employees are treated badly. I uh, last year in an appropriations bill, after getting wind of the governor's plan to uh, privatize some of the functions at the Veterans Home in Marshalltown, I put language in the appropriations bill that said any contractor that contracts for specific services shall provide comparable wages and benefits. That was taken out by the Senate and ultimately was left out. Uh, I think what will happen, and we don't know yet in Marshalltown, is that those folks that were hired by the Veterans Home, 
who have now received their pink slips, something like 150, I think, uh, in dietary and uh, laundry area, uh, where they probably weren't making great wages already, uh, will be terminated and will be rehired by this company with lower wages, and they will have lost growth in their pensions. If they work for state government less than four years, they will have lost their pension and uh, probably will not have health benefits. Now I say I have no problem with privatization uh, as long as you have comparable wages and uh, benefits. Um, and I believe um, if, uh, if we believe what um, private business says, they should be able to compete while still providing private um, uh, comparable wages and benefits because uh, they claim they're more, private business claims they're more efficient. They don't have to go through all the government red tape. They do have to make a profit. But if they can uh, reduce the red tape that government imposes on itself, uh, then, then what they say should be a profit, a reasonable profit. Uh, so it should work that way, but in fact, I believe in most cases where there's been privatization of uh, functions of state government, it has resulted in uh, lower wages and benefits, and that's going to be very difficult for the community of Marshalltown to deal with that because there are a lot of people there. I think it'll happen in all nine of our state institutions eventually, and we haven't been able to stop that. Um, the folks that contract for those services generally, um, I suspect always, would be non-union contractors who would uh, not have the same kind of uh, of, uh, support for the employees as uh, we have in state government. Well, let me go back to that history of what happened over that uh, the last 18 months or so, just to remind you. Uh, in um, Well, early in 1991, so it's actually been two years, the negotiators um, for the negotiations for um, state employees in the five <coughs> unions, we actually have five uh, state employee unions um, they went to arbitration. Arbitrators ruled in favor of the unions. As you know, under arbitration, you pick one side or the other. You don't pick a compromise, because that would certainly encourage everybody to go out to the extreme. And so the arbitrator picks the most reasonable of the two final offers. And the governor's approach was 2% uh, over two years in pay increases, which was way out of line, and everyone knew that, and so the arbitrators in each case ruled in favor of the unions. The um, legislature then appropriated the necessary money to pay those additional wages. The governor vetoed the appropriation and then said he didn't have the money to pay. I'm not going to be real nice to, about the governor in here, I should warn you. <laughs> The uh, unions went to district court to challenge the governor's decision not to pay the uh, wages as uh, the final arbitrator arbitration had ruled. The governor went to court, district court ruled in favor of the unions. The governor appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the unions. So at every step, the arbitrator, the district court and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the union. The cost of this, the legal cost of this, was something like $750,000 to hear again and again that this was the correct decision. So in 1992, we'd gone almost a full year by that time, so in 1992, the legislature again appropriated the money, and by this time, I think it was around $90 million we had to appropriate to take care of two years' wages because we had to deal with the back pay for fiscal uh, 92 and the forward pay for fiscal 93. And we did that, and, and it has moved forward from there. We had to raise the sales tax, as you may recall, to pay those back wages. Well, under the public employee collective bar bargaining law, some trade-offs were made back in the early 70s that said we won't have a strike provision, but we will go to final arbitration and that will be the final decision. 
There was an effort to erode that law, I think, last year uh, to the detriment of the, um, of the public employees, but eventually they, they did prevail. This year I'm serving on the Labor Committee for the first time, and I see all kinds of bills coming through the Labor Committee that are attempts to erode the uh, authority of Chapter 20, the Collective Bargaining Law, and to erode um, labor rights. Uh, I don't know how those will fare. I think they will probably fare better in the Senate than in the House. But state employees, I think, overall are paid pretty well. I looked at some uh, comparisons with um, private employment in the state and public employment, and I think um, overall they're paid, paid pretty well. We have pretty good benefits. Um, uh, pretty good range of benefits. We're paid, theoretically at least, on the basis of comparable worth. And that was done back in 83, 84, 85 to get that accomplished. Comparable worth means you uh, base the pay on um, um, skills, effort, responsibility, and working conditions. Uh, and that was an effort to bring women's type work up to the same level as those of uh, of male employees. We have good sick leave. The governor has uh, repeatedly attacked public employees in the state for abusing sick leave. It is very generous. But I think one explanation for that, and women probably abuse it more than men, um, and one reason is that there are children and women are the primary caregivers. The governor has vetoed our family leave uh, plan when our uh, when it's been offered at the state level. And uh, someone does have to take care of children. Uh, so I think it's something like uh, 30 days a year uh, sick leave benefits, which is very generous. Health care benefits, vacation, flex time in some places, child care only at the DOT. Uh, with the legislature passed a bill several years ago to create a child care facility on the Capitol Complex. A lot of women uh, work at the Capitol Complex. The governor vetoed that. It did seem to us that it was appropriate for the state to lead the way uh, in terms of providing benefits or access to uh, quality child care, but uh, that was vetoed. Well, today, uh, state employees, I think, have to work very hard. Uh, there's understaffing, there's large workloads. I'm most familiar with the Department of Human Services because I, I do work on that uh, committee, uh, chaired that committee for four years and now serve as a ranking member. Recently, we heard that there were 300 positions in the Department of Human Services that were being held open. They were not being filled. And everyone denied responsibility or having anything to do with the decision to hold those positions open. Department of Management didn't know about it. The Department of Human Services didn't know about it, and yet the requests have, have never gone in to get those positions filled. And those of you who may be tuned in to what's happening in human services around the state know that the response is slower and slower to child abuse investigations. The uh, ability to do the things that human services workers out in the field expect to do is very, very limited, and yet there are 300 positions that are funded and are not filled. And that leads to burnout on the part of those who remain employed. So those are some of the problems in, uh, in state government that I see. Um, we have, um, in, in the state as a whole, I think we have a bit of good news, and that is that Iowa has a smaller percentage of our population that's uninsured for health care than many states. And if you look at the nation with something like 37 million uninsured um, Americans, that comes to about 15 percent of our population. In Iowa, it's somewhere around 9 percent. It's for that reason that I've worked very hard to try to get universal access to health care in Iowa, because I think we have a, an easier problem to address in Iowa than we have nationwide. I have not been successful. I hope uh, uh, President Clinton is more successful than I've been on that issue. I don't think um, it's uh, necessarily appropriate that health care 
should be tied to employment. Rather, it should be a basic right of all, whether they're employed or not. But most of the people, most of those 37 million who are uninsured are employed or are family members of, of, unemployed, of, un, of employed persons. Let me make sure I got that right. Most of the 37 million are employed or else they're family members of someone who's employed. So they uh, simply can't afford it or it's not available in their workplace. It's an important issue for the American worker that I think we need to keep on track about. I'll stop there, I have time for questions. Yeah, well we've got plenty of time here. Um, anybody like to share any ideas with us or ask any questions or get some discussion going? Yes. Well, okay, the problem is they pay their workers well. Well, 52% 52 52 of the workforce at UPS are part-time. Most of those part-timers make around $8 an hour. Uh, they are only guaranteed uh, 15 hours of work per week. And the real reality of it is, is that it used to be that the so-called college student, like myself when I went to college, would work part-time at UPS and then after they got their degree and whatever would leave for something else. What's happening though in, in our society and the way the economics are right now with unemployment, people don't want to leave those jobs because they cannot find jobs out there even with four-year degrees that pay eight dollars an hour. Uh, those people who work at UPS want to stay with UPS and see a future at UPS. UPS's motto has always been, you know, uh, that the people who, who work here, uh, you know, make us. They make our business. And we care about our people. That just isn't the case. Uh, we're going into negotiations this year, uh, and we did a survey of the membership uh, throughout the country. Uh, the top two issues amongst part-timers and full-timers was the uh, harassment and intimidation made by management against the workers. We, we, in a way, we have a Japanese model working at UPS. Workers are made to work very hard, to do as much as possible within a certain period of time, and that, and that goes on and on and on. Uh, UPS paints a good image of itself uh, to the public and it provides good benefits to full-time people. Full-time people overall make around $15, uh, $16 an hour and that's good. The problem is the, the, the uh, survival rate for a full-time person is no more than 15 or 20 years. One of the big bargaining items for full-time employees, package car drivers who you see all the time, who I was, uh, are wanting to see a 20-year pension to be able to leave after 20 years because simply we cannot survive past 20 years. It's not so much that it couldn't be a very good place to work. It's just that they have taken some of these team concepts and used it to the hill. They've, uh, they've made their workforce work very hard. Our union was very flexible in understanding that years ago, but the problem is there are now problems and, and the people are working, and the people are made to work very hard. And a lot of, a lot of workers, a lot of full-timers, people who go from part-time to full-time, uh, eventually end up with some sort of back injury or wrist injury uh, uh, during their career. So it, it's not as rosy as people would think, but nor are mo most jobs in this country these days. A lot of white collar jobs these days. I mean, even at Iowa State University, I would assume that the teachers here have to go through a lot of pressure. The, the guarantees are not there like they used to be. Uh, and that's where the union, you know, the Teamsters Union with UPSers, 
we're going to attempt to negotiate uh, language into the contract that protects the workers, <coughs> helps redefine uh, the type of environment in which they work, uh, uh, limit the amount of productivity that they have to produce, and, and make UPS the type of place that most people think that it is. And, uh, and don't be surprised to hear that other companies that's, that have such a rosy picture about how they treat their workers is just the same way. So that's, hopefully that's an answer to your question. I think Aaron was first, Aaron. So the example of UPS, a growing trend among businesses and industry, I mean, more part-time people who are not paid in benefits and stuff, that's a growing trend. Exactly. Yeah. You know, look, look at Walmart, uh, look, look at most, Computer programming jobs. When I graduated in 81, computer programming was, was the job to go for. What are you finding out with computer programmers? Uh, now they apply for companies and maybe uh, they don't get the job, but they're told, well, you know, uh, you can do some contracted out work for us. Stay at home with your computer. Uh, program some stuff for us. We'll pay you so much money, but we won't give you any health care coverage. Uh, we won't cover you under workers' comp. And, uh, you know, the dreams uh, that, the, that students have had that they could leave the university after four years or after getting a PhD and to get a job that would, that would pay forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, unfortunately, is not there anymore. Uh, what's nice to know, and it's, it's good about unions, is that union workers on the whole get paid a heck of a lot more than non-union workers at all different types of levels in all different types of areas, uh, blue-collar workers, white-collar workers. If you look down to the south, uh, uh, freight drivers. Uh, non-union freight drivers uh, get paid on the average twenty two to 28000 a year whereas the union freight driver gets paid 40000 a year. And, uh, so there's a difference there. And what's unfortunate is that white-collar workers, professionals, are not even getting paid near that amount of money for their work when they graduate after four years. And that is really unfortunate. All the years you put into schooling and you do not receive that same amount of money, unless you have a union. So. <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> Well, I'd like to know some of that too, eh? uh, Actually, some of that went to pay unexpectedly high Medicaid costs. Um, because Medicaid has, like all healthcare, you know, has just gone out of control. And uh, since the state pays uh, a big chunk in uh, Medicaid, it, it did go there. Um, other places, uh, some of, well, if you talk about what happened to sales tax, um, you know, about 90 million ultimately went for that, paying back with salaries and paying forward salaries. Uh, but we also spent some to buy down our uh, debt, our gap deficit. Um, so. What could, have been, what could the union have done to save those thousand jobs? And so they, they have a no strike provision. And yeah. It's so cute. Yeah. You know, they, they won the arbitration and so the governor fired the workers. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, I mean, the governor actually fired the workers before the Supreme Court had ruled, but I think he knew what was going to happen, was that they were going, that he was going to lose his case, and he said he had to save back, and he had to start early saving back in order to pay if he lost the case. Um, I, at the time that happened, uh, so many of them were, uh, Department of Human Services employees, and I watched that very closely. And in fact, a disproportionate number were, um, I think something like 75%. And I uh, encouraged our leadership to go to court and get a, an injunction to prohibit the governor from doing that, to actually challenge his authority to do that. Uh, I think it never has been clarified whether he really has that authority. The legislature has to pay for our own legal counsel because the attorney general represents the governor, except that in these instances, the attorney general refused 
to represent the governor because she said he was wrong and she had already given him that advice. She could not have, see she's in the executive branch, she could not turn around and say, well, I'll represent the legislature against the governor then. We would have to hire our own legal counsel and it becomes very complicated. The legislature doesn't very often take on a lawsuit against the governor, occasionally on item vetoes, but not very often. I think that's what we should have done to clarify whether he actually has the authority to move money around as he sees fit and, um, and, and save it for those purposes. Ted? I was going to try to raise this type of question that whether we like it or not, the reality is that the American worker is going to get shafted by our capitalistic system, whether we like it or not. I personally don't like it. Now, uh, I, then I'm raising the question, who is making the decision to shaft the American worker? Maybe I side more with Tony that this is a conscious decision on the part of American management to shaft the American worker, whether it's the governor of the state of Iowa or it's a corporate leader. I don't know whether you would think it's an important impersonal market forces that are operating. But one reason why the worker is getting the shaft is we have to compete in an international market. Now, I guess I would like to maintain the middle class. Let's be realistic, the middle class is shrinking. It'll keep shrinking. But what can we do about it if we want to be competitive in a world economy, if we want to keep the middle class worker well compensated? I guess I'm trying to say I'm caught. What do we do if we're trying to be competitive in a world economy at the same time that we want to maintain benefits and decent wages for the American worker? Okay, um, I think there's two things to look at here. Uh, for too long, unlike the machinery and the cost of the plant, workers have never been considered a fixed cost. They've always been considered a variable cost, meaning the cost of machinery is always the same when you start at the plant or the cost of the computer basically or whatever, whatever you need for your workplace. But when it comes to paying wages to workers and paying for their benefits, companies have always seen that cost as something that they can move up and down on. Well, if we can pay a minimum wage, let's do it. And if we can pay them a little more, let's can't, let's do it. But if our competition is paying less, let's pay less. Uh, there needs to be some sort of policy within our country that, that states such as with the minimum wage, which is extremely low right now, is that workers deserve a certain level of decent pay. They deserve national health care, which our union is for and has been pushing for. And there needs to be jobs provided to anyone who's willing to work. I mean, a policy like that has, has, to, has to be developed. Whether Clinton and his administration will do it or not, we don't know. Our union, though, we, I'd like to think, is on the forefront of that. We've been pushing on that. We endorsed Clinton. We gave a considerable amount of money towards his campaign and other campaigns across the country last fall. And we are continuing to educate our members, in, in, and we are going to Congress to push them to move in the direction of those type of things. Another thing is that there is a responsibility for unions to look beyond the borders of their country and to organize workers in other countries where it has always been low wages in those countries. Look at Mexico right now. Now that we have this uh, uh, National American Free Trade Agreement, uh, the reality is, is Mexican workers are going to be coming here, driving trucks, getting paid $7 a day instead of the 17 or $16 an hour that our truck drivers get here. And, and what, how it affects Iowa in particular is that it's al already been rumored that those meat packing plants here will probably close down and move south and production will start up in the south and even across the border and then meat will be brought up here to Iowa to serve to those of us who've lost our jobs and can't even afford to pay for it anymore. So unions, so getting back to what unions need to do is that we need to look beyond our borders. We need to organize workers in other country and bring up 
uh, that standard of living. And with some success, uh, 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 some successes have already happened, so we need to move forward on that. On the other side, though, the government needs to adopt policies that addresses the rights of workers. We certainly don't have enough rights now. And uh, the reality, too, without a union, when you go to work out there without a union, basically when you go into your shop, you lose all constitutional rights, which is very unfortunate. Workers in this country without a union, without union representation, basically have no rights when they go to work for an employer. They cannot control how much they get paid. They cannot control the amount of work they receive. They cannot control the amount of benefits they get. So that in a nutshell. Pat, I, uh, um, Joe's given it a noble effort, but I don't think your question can be answered during the limited time we have here. I think it's a very complicated one. But one issue that I think is very important is recognizing that almost all income gains that the American worker has made over the last decade have gone into increased health care costs. It's such an urgent problem that there's been no real income growth for the American worker. They've only been able to, through their employer, if they, if they get it that way, keep up with uh, the increased cost of, of health care. So it's, I think, the most urgent matter we have on the table now is to get control over health care so that businesses even can um, save and be competitive in international markets. They're, they're losing that competition because of their uh, cost of health care. Individuals are not uh, being paid adequately because all of their increases are in health care. Important matter. Yes. This, this occurred to me, and I don't think that I can say it well, but businesses are also being regulated a lot. And um, so one who goes into a small business um, and tries to do all of the, uh, <coughs> the right things for everything, there's not much incentive for or disposable income that they have. And it's happening to the farmer, and it's happening a lot. Supply side economics, Reaganomics. We were all made to believe that competitive, you know, a competitive atmosphere would help uh, help business and help working people. Well, we we've had 12 years of that, and wages have gone down, and 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 healthcare workers especially can't even get healthcare. Right. You talked about the preferences over the years, uh, about expectancy. Nurses right. that are working 12 and 14 hour shifts. Healthcare workers have among the highest premiums. My own daughter and son-in-law are both healthcare workers, and their participation in their group plan has gone up to five hundred dollars a month. Jackie. Yeah. I think she's right, though, about uh, those regulations that have had a, a very adverse impact on small business. That, uh, well, we've become more aware of environmental impacts, so we do environmental regulations, and I don't think we want to stop that. We've uh, become more aware of safety standards, so OSHA comes in, and I don't think we want to stop that. So there are a lot of new regulations that we have enacted that I think are very important to protect that American worker. And how you do that and still protect small business is, is a fine balance. But uh, you know, I, I've said over and over to businesses that if they can tell me 
of unnecessary regulations that are not there to really protect someone. I'll get them repealed if, if I have anything to do with it. I've said that to the nursing home industry because they certainly do complain a lot. But I can't get them repealed if it's federal. Maybe. <laughs> but if it's a state regulation that's unnecessary, we all feel the same in the legislature that we don't want all this burdensome regulation. Uh, there's something to be said about uh, regulation, too. Uh, Reagan thought in 1980 that the trucking industry needed to be deregulated. Uh, the Ma and Pa trucking outfits, who, who employed 30 or 40 truck drivers, were paying their workers a very decent wage. They were paying them about $12 an hour, I think, back then. Uh, when some of the larger corporations you know, moved for deregulating that industry. What happened was it was the small freight shops that closed, and over 180,000 trucking jobs were lost within that industry. So, you know, deregulation. You know, when you look at what happens and and what effect it has, you have to look at the players and the move in this country again over the last 12 years is to use deregulation to hurt small business and to hurt working people. Look at the airline industry. Exactly. <laughs> that was another one. We're getting that was about two or three. Or <laughs> airline. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, Mexico would have to bring up its standard of living before the North American Free Trade uh, Treaty goes into effect. Uh, no, they wouldn't. Uh, you said it should. It should. We're opposing it right now. We're opposing opposing the free trade agreement right now as it stands because Clinton has not brought up anything to protect American workers, anything to guarantee that the environmental impact that will happen and, and the economic impact that will happen uh, will will protect American workers. And when I guess when I talk about American workers, not you know, I'm not just talking about Mexico in the United States, but I'm also talking about Canada, because Canadian, uh, Canadians are very concerned about this free trade agreement. I mean, their, gover their government's in favor of, favor of it, but the workers there are very much against it, because there just aren't any safeguards. There's no protection. Uh, bottom line, that, that agreement was made just, just for the sake of cheap labor. That's all it was. So there needs to be some safeguards. And we're going to continue to push for them. We have, we've already met with, uh, our union has already met with over 60 key congressional people to talk about the free trade agreement and other issues of concern. And we've done that. Uh, we started that in January. We're not waiting. And every local union within, within this country is focused on that. And so there's one advantage of it. Uh, we'll export our Corporal tunnel syndrome, probably <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I'd just like to add one quick point on this NAFTA thing, too. I think um, it isn't just the case that this is going to have a negative impact on U.S. jobs, because you could still, even if that were the case, you could still make some sort of argument that maybe U.S. jobs will come, uh, their wage rate will come down a little bit, but Mexican workers' wage rates will rise, and maybe they'll meet somewhere in the middle, and maybe that'll be better for everybody in the long run or something like that. Uh, but that argument doesn't work because it's not only the case that these free trade agreements are, are going to negatively affect U.S. wages, but we can look at what's happened in Mexico since 1980, where there's been a tremendous increase in exports from Mexico to the United States already, and a lot of free, a lot of trade um, tariffs and so on between Mexico and the United States have already been eliminated, and the and the wages of workers in, in Mexico since 1980 have declined by a third. Uh, so there's certainly no guarantee at all that as yeah. U.S. wages go down, the Mexican wages are going to go up and meet somewhere in the middle. There's just no guarantee yeah. that's going to happen at all. And uh. oh, really, to quickly bring up something that's interesting, too, Mexico is also negotiating with other uh, South American countries, Central American countries, to figure out on how they can provide business for them because Mexico is the only country that's limited to this agreement. 
but uh, that's not stopping Mexico from doing some game playing of its own with countries south of it to, to make money for them, again, off the backs of labor. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, I've got a question about, you know, we look at government and, and who really controls government. I would say it's corporate America. You know, you think, you know, Bill Clinton, then he just got in. Well, he's already um, looking for money, getting money from tax, you know, for his reelection. And I think that's something that would need to be changed. And you said the Teamsters gave $5 million. And I'm sure that's something that they have to do because everybody else is pumping money in there. Yeah. And I, to play the game, you got to do it right there. Yeah. Is that something that's going to need to be changed to kind of get the corporate culture out of the government? Well, the only way you're going to do it is with people in this country participating more within the political system. And that, again, is what we're trying to do in our union. We cannot assume, no member of our union can assume that the government's going to look out for them without them pushing uh, our agenda, a working people's agenda. So, you know, who controls the U.S. government? Those who have the money right now. But as time goes on, through more lobbying effort, effort through more participation w within your union, if you belong to a union or go into a union, or with whatever group, uh, the dynamics of this uh, political system can change. Well, I strongly support uh, better campaign finance reform, uh, keep those Teamsters from giving $5 million to <laughs> but also keeping the bankers and the insurance industry and others from having as much influence as they do. If you're interested in this topic, I'm sure it's going to be covered in tonight's talk. Uh, Mr. Barlett, has his book, What's Wrong in America, certainly has a, his last chapter is about financing of the political system. Quick remark by Wayne, and then we'll call it a session. <laughs> so, all you'd have to do is see me, that's all. You know what's amazing is that uh, other, other universities in this state are organized. And they do receive better pay. And what's unfortunate about the bosses of this institution is that they have a tendency not to look at, at the value of their own people. And they're going to lose the value of their people. By continuing, by continuing to pay them less than the comparable wage in other institutions. I'd like to thank both of our panelists, uh, Johnny Hammond and Joe Henry, and thank you for being such a good audience. Well, Wayne, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you ready?